This is a pleasant task to introduce our guest. I guess it was a year ago we met. I uh, was invited by USIA to lecture in Scandinavia, and I was very graciously hosted by our speaker, uh, who was a professor of history at the University of Lund in uh, southern Sweden. I think our weather is a little better here today than it was when I was in Sweden a year ago. I think we were, we were at the tail end of some kind of hurricane. We had hurricanes in Sweden. I don't think we were there. Not really. But there was a big storm that swept through uh, Scandinavia. Nevertheless, uh, that's a delightful place to visit, no matter what the weather might be. It's a great uh, university, a great institution, and I enjoyed my visit immensely, and also particularly enjoyed coming acquainted with our guest, Professor Juran Riestad. Uh, Professor Riestad is a Swedish scholar. He uh, received the appropriate degrees to become a professor. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the system in Scandinavia or in Europe in general, and that is quite an honor and a distinction in of itself to be a professor. There are not very many of them, and that usually involves occupying a chair. And in our case, uh, Dr. Jürgen Riestadt is a dean and uh, does a variety of things uh, in, in the area of administration and research as well as teaching. <coughs> he has published more than two dozen books and many articles, both in English and in Swedish. He is uh, a professor of history, as I mentioned, but also has a very strong, has had a very strong interest in American studies. Probably know more about how our political system works than many of us do. Uh, he has been a fellow at Harvard University uh, on two different occasions and at the John F. Kennedy Institute in Berlin. Uh, he's uh, been uh, in this country many times uh, as a visiting lecturer or professor, and he even spent a few weeks as a guest lecturer at the Chinese Academy of Social Science in Beijing. Uh, he has, uh, will be lecturing to us this morning on <coughs> the subject in the eye of the cyclone, Swedish neutrality in his background. Professor, you have to Thank you, Ray, for your very gracious introduction. It's a great honor to be here and also a great pleasure, of course. What is the role played by a neutral state in the international political system? Is neutrality itself an archaic concept? with no relevance to contemporary international politics? Or is neutrality merely a narrow legal concept with no political role at all? This is the opening lines of a recent article in Foreign Affairs. The author, Richard Sincere, a Washington-based foreign policy consultant, then goes on to explore some of the problems related to the concept of neutrality and the various interpretations and implementations in the 20th century. The conclusion of this article is that there is much more to be discussed in relation to neutrality, that there is a hole in the literature which deserves to be filled. I have no intention to fill it today. My purpose is more modest, that is, to take a look at one particular neutral country, Sweden, the historical background of its policy of non-alignment and neutrality, and to, to some related present-day problems. Neutrality is the status in international law which the state endeavors to attain during time of war between other powers. Neutrality is intended to make it clear that the nation in question has no plans to intervene in the conflict that it expects the belligerent party to refrain from attacking the territory of the neutral state in order to obtain strategical, economic, or politi political advantages in the struggle against the enemy. 
impartiality and respected territorial territory integrity are the two principal pillars of neutrality. Strictly speaking, neutrality is something which exists only in time of war. However, in a wider sense, we can also speak of a policy of neutrality in peacetime. A state can systematically create conditions to enable it to adopt a neutral position in the event of war. The most important of these conditions is to avoid all associations which could more or less automatically drag the state into one of the Brit on one of the British sides in the event of conflict. Of equal importance is the neutral state's possession of sufficiently strong defense forces to ensure that neutrality promotes credibility. Sweden has often found herself in the eye of the cyclone, watching the smaller countries around her being drawn into wars or entering cooperation with different great powers. That Swedish foreign policy, or rather the history of it, can lay claim to more than local <coughs> interest is above all due to the fact that the country has now enjoyed peace for almost for more than 150 years. How then can this be reconciled? Swedish foreign policy has traditionally one simple top priority, and that is to keep Sweden out of war. In order to understand the present day Swedish policy of neutrality and non-alignment, one must take into account the historical dimension. The Swedish policy of non-alignment and neutrality is to a large extent a result of histor historical experience. <coughs> In the Middle Ages, Sweden had already conquered and Christianized Finland, but the country's greatest period of expansion did not set in until the 16th century, the middle of the 16th century. It was then that the Baltic order states were subdued, and in a struggle with Russia and above all with Poland, Sweden conquered first Estonia and then Ingomanland and Livonia. Russia was thereby excluded from the Baltic, and the Swedes were well on the way to accomplish their goal, namely the creation of a Baltic Empire, a Dominion Maris Baltici. The stakes were high control of the valuable Russian market and the possibility of levying toll on Russian goods, the unrestricted flow of which was of such vital importance to Western Europe. The part played by Sweden in the Thirty Years' War during the first half of the 17th century resulted in her finally emerging as a great power. Her territorial gains included large parts of Pomerania and other North German lands. During the same period, a decision was reached in the age-old struggle between Sweden and Denmark for hegemony <coughs> in the north. Denmark was conquered and had to give up a third of her kingdom, including those uh, provinces which today constitute the southernmost part of Sweden. Well, Sweden's success at empire building had no counterpart in her dom domestic resources. She, was far too, she had a far too small population, quite inadequate to resist the strains and stresses to which the newly created empire was soon <coughs> to be exposed. Still more serious were the total lack of sufficient economic resources. The Great Northern War, which breaking out in 1700, raged simultaneously with the War of the Spanish Succession ended with the complete collapse of the Swedish Empire. Russia replaced Sweden as the great power of Northern Europe. The outcome of the struggle resulted in Russia reaching the Baltic on a wide front. The Baltic states were now incorporated in the Russian Empire, where they remained apart for a short period of freedom between the two world wars. Sweden's foreign policy during the 18th century was characterized by wavering between resignation and dreams of revenge. Two wars were fought with Russia, both without success. Finland was still left to Sweden, and fear of renewed Russian attacks constantly underlies Swedish foreign policy. During the Napoleonic Wars, Sweden took sides against France, 
After the settlement between Russia and Napoleon at Tilsit in 1807, Sweden found herself to fa face to face with a highly dangerous situation. The peace of Tilsit between France and Russia, like the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939, was the modus vivendi agreement. Its implications were that the two adversaries should give each other free hand to embark on other ventures whilst waiting for the final showdown. As in 1939, the result was a Russian attack on Finland. In the Russo-Swedish War of 1809, 1808, 1809, Sweden was defeated and compelled to relinquish Finland. The dream of revenge on Russia, of taking back Finland, was kept alive and lay behind the choice of the French Marshal Bernadotte as a successor to the Swedish throne in 1810. However, Bernadotte realized that Napoleon's position was undermined. He therefore forced through a radical change in Swedish foreign policy, aligning Sweden with Russia and England. And thanks to this new policy, Bernadotte secured for himself and Sweden an important reward, Norway. Norway was torn from Denmark, which was bound to France, and united to Sweden. Thus, the acquisition of Norway compensated for the loss of Finland. In the 1850s, a new orientation of Swedish foreign policy again took place. The growing tension between Russia and the Western powers caused the Swedish king to establish a closer understanding, above all, with England. In the event of war, he hoped that the Western powers would concentrate their forces in the Baltic and mount an attack on St. Petersburg. Sweden would then take in part with an army in Finland, thus winning back her former possessions. That the Western powers preferred to launch their attack in 1853 on the Crimea instead of in the Baltic caused him bitter disappointment. And with the peace signed in Paris in 1856, all dreams of a Swedish Baltic Empire had to be jettisoned. Swedish-Russian relations were seriously strained and fear of Russia continued to be the outstanding feature of Swedish foreign policy. Another important problem for the Scandinavian states at the time was Scandinavianism. A feeling of kinship and mutual interest supplanted all <coughs> ancient rivalries between the Nordic countries. Dreams of a Nordic unity emerged. And United Nord, uh, North would have far greater possibilities of holding its own. Moreover, the Danes had another cogent reason for backing Scandinavianism. To the South, German nationalism was growing ever, ever stronger, and above all, Russia had emerged as a powerful state. The Danish crown included in the positions of the Duchy of Schleswig-Holstein, of which Holstein was purely German and considerable parts of Schleswig had also a German-speaking <coughs> population. In 1864, the conflict led to war, and in this, Denmark stood alone. The Swedish king wished to support Denmark, but his ministers took a more realistic view. The outcome was a defeat for Denmark and the collapse of political Scandinavianism. The events connected with the Crimean War and the Schleswig-Holstein crisis had clearly demonstrated the futility of Swedish efforts to pursue an active foreign policy. The conception of an enlightened foreign policy of neutrality with a consistent refusal to be involved in foreign entanglements began to take shape. The technical and demographical developments during the latter half of the 19th century had the effect that the gap between great powers and minor states tended to widen with respect to power. From this point of view, efforts to, uh, to establish neutrality may be interpreted as an attempt <coughs> to affirm a system in which so sovereignty rested on law and custom instead of power. After the victory over France in 1870-71, Germany emerged as an ever stronger factor in the struggle for mastery of the Baltic. 
England's influence in the area was considerable throughout the entire 19th century, and owing to Anglo-Russian antagonism, England appeared for a long time to offer a natural protection against the Eastern threat and to constitute a counterweight to Russia. However, as a result of an increase in German naval and construction at the turn of the century, it seemed highly doubtful whether England would be able to maintain her protective role or even enter the Baltic with her navy. Instead, for a long period, Swedish foreign policy was to be decided by her geographical location in relation to Germany and Russia. For other reasons also, a rapprochement with Germany had begun as early as the 1870s and 80s. The upper classes were increasingly influenced by German culture. German institutions, educational systems, and military training became the order of the day, especially among conservatives. To this development contributed the need for protection against Russia. The increased Russian oppression in Finland towards the end of the 19th century was taken as a threat also to Sweden. The dissolution of the Union with Norway in 1905 meant that Sweden's security policy position to some extent improved. Norwegian territory, which was to be of increasing importance from the point of view of military strategy due to the growing Anglo German rivalry was to provide a defensive buffer zone between Sweden and the North Atlantic. The outbreak of the First World War, um, on the outbreak of the First World War, a policy of neutrality was a logical consequence of the, by this time, traditional foreign policy. In certain circles, it's true, an interventionist current of opinion demanded Swedish, Sweden's entry into the war on the German side. The driving force uh, behind this opinion was never strong, uh, and behind it lay, as always, the fear of Russian aggression. However, the government endeavored to pursue a policy of strict neutrality. The sympathies of the Social Democrats and the Liberals were overwhelmingly on the side of the Entente, the Western powers, and these parties were steadily gaining influence, taking over the government in Sweden in 1917. <coughs> the outcome of the First World War created an, an, an entirely new and favorable, from the Swedish standpoint, situation in the Baltic. The two dominating Baltic maritime powers, Russia and Germany, emerged from the war defeated and greatly weakened. On the east coast of the Baltic, a number of independent states had emerged, and Russian access to the Baltic was cut off, except for the innermost part of the Gulf of Finland. German sea power had been broken, and its naval supremacy in the Baltic no longer existed. It could therefore be assumed that one of the main tenets of Sweden's, uh, Sweden's foreign policy, fear of Russian aggression uh, and expansion, had no longer any basis in fact. But from another angle, the communist Soviet Union had become a disturbing factor. Instead of the authoritarian expansionist policy of Tsarist Russia, the Soviet Union now appeared as a champion of world revolution. In 1920, Sweden joined the League of Nations. It was hoped that a new and better era had dawned with the formulation of the League of Nations Covenant. Consequently, neutrality as a watchword of Swedish foreign policy soon started to meet competition from solidarity. The order of the day no longer needed to be an egocentric aloofness from the power play among, between the great powers. Instead, wholehearted efforts should be directed towards working together with other states to achieve a new and safer collective work, world order. Swedish politicians participated enthusiastically in the <coughs> meetings of the League of Nations in Geneva. Matters of security policy were pushed into the background. Neutrality and pacifism became widespread in Sweden 
as in many other countries during the 1920s. And one of the results was the carrying out of a large measure of unilateral uh, disarmament. However, the 1930s quickly showed a fiercer international, international climate. With the victory of Nazism in Germany, there followed a more positive attitude in Sweden towards the Soviet Union. Sweden's peace was considered by many to depend on Russian strength as a counterweight to Germany. Confidence in the League of Nations as a guarantor of peace received a final blow with the fiasco of the League sanctions against Italy when the latter launched her attack on Ethiopia in 1935. The reaction was so violent that many of the leading, leading newspapers in Sweden, and not, and, and not uh, in considerable opinion, demanded Sweden's withdrawal from the League. And in the company of Norway, Denmark, Finland, Holland, Switzerland, and Spain, the Swedish government issued on the 1st of July 1936 a statement to the effect that they no longer considered themselves bound by decisions on sanctions taken by the League of Nations. Solidarity, which for a small state involved the duty of playing a weak hand in great power game with high stakes, had now served its purpose as a password. Neutrality, which had been a trusty servant in bad times before, was now restored to its place of honor, and the government started to give priority to security questions. This included cooperation between the four Nordic countries for the purpose of promoting their own common neutrality in the event of war. A deep feeling of common interest between the Nordic countries had existed ever since the days of Scandinavianism. It had even survived the crisis of 1905, when the Swedish-Norwegian Union was dissolved. Some Swedes now thought that the Nordic situation ought to be consolidated by a defense alliance between the four countries. But these countries feared different powers, and they believed in different methods to divert the threat. The Norwegians, for example, felt secure on their own. The Danes appeased the Germans, the Finns opposed the Russians, and the Swedes, who feared both the Germans and the Russians, pursued a prudent but armed neutrality. Only the Finns wanted military cooperation with Sweden. The result was the Swedish-Finnish negotiations of these negotiations was the so-called Stockholm Plan of 1939 for Finno-Swedish common defense of the Orland Islands in the Baltic between Finland and Sweden. The Stockholm Plan, however, was never implemented. The Western powers agreed to it in principle, but Moscow rejected the proposal. Thus, the question was unsettled at the outbreak of the Second World War. After the Russian attack on Finland at the end of November 1939, the Swedish government did not issue any declaration of neutrality. And this was facilitated by the fact that the Soviet Union did not define her conflict with Finland as a war. Sweden adopted a non-belligerent status, which, among other things, made it possible to organize considerable aid for Finland, and many thousand Swedes took place to part in uh, the war as volunteers. Even if activistic currents of opinion existed, urging Swedish intervention on the Finnish side, the Swedish coalition government upheld the country's traditional neutral foreign policy. And even after the outbreak of the so-called continuation war, Sweden supported Finland with, with material aid. Sweden also tried to mediate a Finnish-Soviet uh, peace and limit German influence in Helsinki. Helsinki. In April 1940, Norway and Denmark were attacked, attacked by Germany because of Hitler's wish to secure the German import of Swedish iron ore. Sweden did nothing to support the Norwegians during the war in the spring of 1940. Germany was a much more formidable power than Russia, and the Norwegians were less effective in defending themselves than the Finns. Also, Norway's war had from the start 
been a part of the war between the great powers, surrounded by German divisions after the end of the war in Norway from June 1940, Sweden made some concessions to German demands, namely by granting them the right to use Swedish railways for military transports, especially transportation of unarmed but uniformed military personnel in special trains to Norway. The uh, most far-reaching concessions were, were made at mid-summer 1941, when Germany's and Finland's war with the Soviet Union began. Then a fully equipped field division was transported by rail through Sweden from Norway to Finland, and Jenner's permission was given for aircraft to fly over Swedish territory and naval vessels to pass through Swedish waters. But there the peak had been reached. After that, the government tried to hold back new concessions and as time passed also to withdraw those granted earlier. The Western powers on the other side raised their demands in pace with Germany's <coughs> reverses. As time passed, they demanded that earlier Swedish concessions to Germany should be annulled and that exports to Germany of goods essential to the German war machine, such as iron ore and ball bearings, should be reduced more and more, and finally, that all trade with Germany should cease. The Swedish government gradually found themselves forced to make more and more extensive concessions. Nor were the trade concessions the only ones. The Western powers were granted many facilities in the field of air warfare, the repatriation of airmen who had been forced down in <coughs> Swedish territory, air transport over Swedish territory for the Allies, the surrender of remains of German uh, V-1 and V-2 rockets. After having balanced painstakingly between the power blocks, Sweden had succeeded in keeping out of the Second World War. The illusions cherished about a post-war development towards a better and more equitable world order were mo much less high-flown after the Second than after the First World War, also in Sweden. After the end of the Second World War, Sweden lay in the front line area between the communist and the Western power spheres of influence. The Soviet was now master of the Baltic, and no counterweight existed. Finland was still independent, but nevertheless lay in the Soviet sphere. The three Baltic countries were now incorporated in the Soviet Union, and the entire South Baltic coast, as far as Lübeck, was controlled by the Russians. When the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union began in 1947, the Swiss made a more determined effort than in the 1930s to keep her Nordic neighbors together by offering a defense alliance. Finland was not included this time. Her special relationship with the Soviet <coughs> Union was formalized in April 1948 just before the discussions with the Norwegians and Danes started. Sweden was spurred to abandon her isolated neutrality only by the fear that her western neighbors might otherwise seek security by joining the big powers in the west. If they did, this would transmit international tensions to Sweden's borders and make it more difficult to stay out of future wars. Denmark and Norway share, to some extent, the same traditional attitude to external problems as Sweden, but the experience gained by these countries in the course of the Second World War created misgivings to, as to their ability to preserve their neutrality and independence by their own efforts. In spring 1948, Sweden presented a plan according to which the Scandinavian countries should create an independent defense alliance outside the great power blocks. Denmark on the whole welcomed the plan, but Norwegian lack of interest caused it to be abandoned. The Norwegians preferred to accept the US offer to join the Atlantic Alliance. <coughs> A neutral Scandinavian alliance as offered by the Swedes was not considered to provide enough security in a world of superpowers. And then the Danes followed the Norwegians into NATO.
Sweden's offer to Denmark and Norway uh, could be said to aim at the extension of Swedish neutrality to apply to the whole of Scandinavia. A switch uh, in foreign policy away from neutrality was never intended. Most Swedes were convinced that for Sweden to join NATO would mean to divide the Nordic area sharply between the two blocks and extend the confrontation line on the European continent to the north. It would ruin Finland's attempt to limit her ties with the Soviet Union and keep her domestic system intact. This pattern of Nordic security has later become known as the Nordic balance. Its condition is a non-aligned, relatively strongly armed Sweden between on the one hand Finland and on the other hand Denmark, Norway associated with NATO by means of a watered-down membership, which in peacetime does not require the stationing of nuclear weapons or allied troops on Scandinavian soil. And it has proved possible to maintain the Nordic balance and uh, because it has proved to be compatible with the interest of the superpowers. One obvious com condition, possibly the most important, is that Sweden must retain her political independence and military strength. But uh, as a result of economic recess in Sweden, there were carried out a relatively extensive reduction of her defenses in the 1970s. The peacetime establishment of the armed forces has been specifically hard hit. Certain spectac spectacular great power violations of Swedish territory in recent times may reveal an intention to test the credibility of Swedish defense. A Swedish military vacuum would, if permitted to arise, <laughs> constitute a grave risk to the Nordic balance. This balance also seems to be threatened by other factors. Sweden has recognized that its northern region possesses more strategic value than it did 20 or 30 years ago. A foreign analyst has remarked that Sweden is the key to the northern flank, and the northern flank is the key to Central Europe. This view reflects the Soviet buildup in the Baltic and on the Kola Peninsula and the construction of the world's largest naval base at Murmansk. The whole idea of neutrality seems originally to be foreign to both Marxism and Marxism-Leninism. It simply does not fit into the dialectic scheme. Sincere, the article, I, the author of the article I mentioned earlier, quotes uh, Lenin's derision of neutrality as, quote, the petty, the petty striving of petty states to hold aloof, the petty bourgeois desire to keep away as far as possible from the great battles of history based entirely on illusions, on, on illusions. But over the last 30 years or so, the Soviet Union seems to have come to terms with neutrality and even encourages neutralism among small states, of course, when it coincides with Soviet interests. The Soviet leaders appear to have accepted the present Nordic situation, realizing that a more clear division of the Nordic area between the military blocs would not be to the advantage of the Soviet Union. <coughs> Swedish Foreign policy is char characterized by a lo very low profile in Europe, unwillingness to do anything that would affect the balance of power or that would entail any form of commitments. That means avoidance of anything that would act as a constraint on the traditional Swedish policy of non-alignment. The activist part has been reserved for international and global uh, engagements. These, these have manifested themselves in two different ways. One is a tendency which in Sweden often is or was called the Palme Doctrine, to act as spokesman for small states, to articulate fears and suspicions of the ever-increasing power of the great powers and the dangers and threats to small small powers in the world 
dominated by these great powers. <coughs> you could talk about efforts to, to create an international small state solidarity. The implications of this small state doctrine are not quite clear, and to some extent it might be just rhetoric. Secondly, the second tendency concerns the problems of the poor nations in the third world where the active Swedish policy is developed mostly within the, within the framework of the United Nations. The constructive element of this policy have been very extensive aid programs for developing countries. The Riksdag, the Swedish parliament, has decided that assistance to developing countries shall amount to 1% of the GNP. In the case of the leading industrial nations, assistance to the developing countries is estimated to amount to about 1.0.3%. Uh, that is one third of, this, of the Swedish. It may also be noted that Sweden has found it compatible with her policy of neutrality to give economic and humanitarian aid to national liberation movements in the third world. Thus, Sweden has tried to combine a low profile in foreign, foreign policy with efforts to establish a position for herself between the East and the West, and also as a sort of intermediary between the North and the South, not least within the United Nations. The positions have so far been rather advantageous, but naturally there are inherent complications in the form of split loyalties and clashes of interest. Sweden's neutrality is an important marketing tool, especially in the third world, where customers, for political reasons, want to avoid direct economic ties with one or the other global power block. Sweden has a large number of multinational corporations which carry the national flag, in that they make it clear where they come from. The relationship of Sweden to the third world goes beyond trade, however and is reflected in its general foreign policy. Although never formally a member of the Non-Aligned Movement, founded in 1961, and now consisting of more than 100 members, mostly from the Third World, the policies and postures emanating from Stockholm, particularly during Rudolf Palme's tenure as Prime Minister, have had a distinctly non-aligned flavor. Sweden is among the industrial countries that have taken most of a pro-South stand in North-South issues regarding uh, decolonization, foreign aid, a new international economic order, etc. In the very nature of neutrality, there exists a form of isolation. The opposite of isolation is integration. For the neutral state, therefore, a cardinal problem arises to what extent can independence and non-alignment in foreign policy be reconciled with such cooperation across the borders as is intended to bring about integration in various fields? While refusing political commitments of a certain kind, Sweden has also a long tradition as a staunch supporter of, of international uh, organizations and as a participant in major efforts regarding aid an international program of cooperation. The Swedish policy of neutrality has not prevented the country from joining the United Nations and its various agencies, or indeed other international organizations, for example, OECD, GATT, and the Council of Europe. The emergence of the European community raised the problem of interdependence in a new way for all Nordic countries. They had to consider membership in an organization aiming not only at interdependence, but at integration. The alternative was to stay outside the place where decisions of major importance to them would be taken in any case. The Swedes finally opted for the second alternative. However, the argument was not that Sweden opposed economic integration, but that the foreign policy coordination as well as the economic and monetary union planned by the common market countries would be detrimental to the credibility of neutrality. No doubt, uneasiness with integration as such 
in particular the formal obligation to comply with majority decision, also was a contributory factor. Great Britain and Denmark joined the community. Norway, after a national referendum, decided to remain outside. After a number of months had been trade, Sweden received a special agreement with the EC in 1972. The challenge of the West European integration is still with Sweden. It worries that about the danger of being cut adrift from the European mainstream as the community moves to create by the early 1990s its internal market for uh, free movement of people, commodities, services, services and capital. The Swedes do not want to suffer economically due to their political neutrality. But this is an issue that still is unsolved in Sweden. A more activist, politicized role for neutral states has emerged during the last 20 years, with Austria and perhaps even more Sweden as the new models. Their diplomatic activity has been much greater than, for example, that of Switzerland in efforts at resolving international disputes. Sweden, it has been asserted, exemplifies the mediatory role appropriate to neutrality more than any other neutral, who often appear as restrict to restrict their involvement to providing a conference circuit for the resolution of conflict. The Swedish refugee program and the level of economic and development aid sent to the third world have been praised as examples of Swedish, Sweden's definition of its self-interest in terms of common good and common security. According to one commentator, Sweden, Swedish international behavior in general is conceived as, quote, a compensation for being neutral, as if neutrality was something of a misdemeanor in an ethical offense. There may, may be a grain of truth in this view of Swedish positive internationalism as a form of atonement for the offense of being neutral. However, this should not be exaggerated. Another interpretation holds that the North-South internationalism concerns were rooted not in Swedish neutrality nor in the national character, but in the personality of Olof Palme. He alone was able to drag Sweden onto the international stage and hold it there an admonishment to other less altruistic foreign policies. Sweden's much, much publicized disagreement with the United States, first over Vietnam and later over Latin America, are in this interpretation seen as instigated by Palme, projecting his own liberal conscience as that of his more inward-looking nation. Those who adhere to this view would, of course, expect Sweden to step back from the international stage under the less charismatic and less internationally oriented successor Ingvar Carlsson. There is no doubt that Palme's personality and special interest mean a great deal for the projection of Swedish international image. But Sweden's in engagement and activities in this area did not appear with Palme. They have a long history, symbolized by name, names such as Yalma Banting, Swedish Prime Minister and staunch support of the League of Nations in the 1920s. Ersten Undén, Foreign Minister, an internationally renowned expert on international law. Folke Bernadot, Raoul Wallenberg, Doug Hammarskjöld, and others. I believe that we have to take into account also the Swedish political culture, connected with the Swedish model with its emphasis on solidarity, pragmatism, and compromise and not least the Swedish self-image, product of the country's historical experience. An American historian, the late William Newman of Goucher College, once planned a research project aimed at studying the way in which former great powers adjusted to the situation of no longer being great power, to their loss of empire and status. Sweden was one of his objects of study, 
And his tentative hypothesis was that Sweden's consistent involvement in international organizations such as the League of Nations, the United Nations, the International Red Cross, and others, its willingness to participate in peacekeeping operations and similar international efforts was a way of reformulating the country's great power ambitions. Be that as it may, the historical experience has no doubt been decisive for the development of Sweden's contemporary policy of non-alignment and neutrality. Thank you. Now I know that the class hour ends in just a few moments, but uh, those of you who and those of you who need to leave, feel free to leave. But those of you who'd like to ask some questions, we have uh, until noon. We can take questions. Responsibilities of neutrals for security. Suppose that, that Hitler had won in World War II, and that, that neutrals sort of stood on the side, whether it be Sweden or Switzerland. I, I just wonder about that. I get into discussions in Switzerland on this matter uh, about, uh, about whether whether in, in, the, this, in the modern world, even though it may benefit a particular state, whether there is a defensible moral position in, in uh, not taking a stand and having, in a sense, your security guaranteed and paid for by somebody else. Well, this is a question that has been raised many times, and uh, of course, there is no easy answer to it. Uh, in the first place, Swedish neutrality does not mean neutrality in peacetime, meaning that there is any constraint on Swedes expressing their views on what's happening in the world. Uh, there was a great um, uproar about the statements by the Swedish government and by the Parliament during the Vietnam War. But the standpoint in Sweden was that we are totally free to take stand and to, to express our views. That is not uh, included in, in our policy on non-alignment. On alignment is a, a way of preserving our options to stay neutral in war. It does not mean any kind of moral neutrality. Uh, and then, of course, you can uh, look at the problem of why not take a stand in the Second World War, for example. Well, it's easy to say that um, uh, with the, the problem is who would Sweden have served by joining the war? There was no chance for us to, to really change the outcome of the war. And the, the, the stand, the argument used in Sweden was that Norway, Denmark, and Finland, it was in their best interest for Sweden to stay out of the war, to preserve her resources, and to be able to take part in the rebuilding uh, of Scandinavia. Sweden had no chance of, 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 of changing the outcome of the German occupation of Denmark or, or Norway, nor could Sweden intervene with any chance of success stopping the Soviet Union in her attack on Finland in 1939. So even from the point of view of these countries, Sweden's options, uh, the policy Sweden opted for was in their interest as well. But I, I agree that, that the, the point of the moral question was felt, of course, by many Swedes. But uh, you can also say that there was no public basis for any other policy. Uh, policy. The uh, duty of the Swedish government was to try to do its best to, to in the interest of the people, that is, to keep Sweden out of the war. That would be a reflection, if I can just respond, a reflection then, I take it, of this pragmatic yeah. view yeah. of Sweden's role in the world that has grown out of the historical experience. 
as opposed to one that we have had in this country, which is, I wouldn't say more ideological, but, but is where, where we have uh, been heavily motivated on occasions by, by something other than a pragmatic point of view. Well, I want to go into that because that's a matter for a couple of conferences um, to start with. Uh, I mean, what is really rhetoric and what is the basic fact? What is, is do you think that, uh, to put it bluntly, that the United States intervened in 1917 and 1941 for uh, moral reasons? And not pragmatic? Well, I think it's complex. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I would like to uh, make a very brief comment and then ask you a question. I remember well uh, 25 or 30 years ago uh, the world refugee problem. I've forgotten uh, the details about what countries were involved. But I remember the United States taking the position we'll take, uh, we'll take refugees so long as they are healthy as long as they can pass a physical examination. We won't take those that are sick. Sweden took the position send your sick ones to us. I remember that very, very well, and I was very moved by it. My question is, do you, has anybody studied, or do you have any uh, uh, views about whether or not per capita income in Sweden is higher or lower today because of its uh, status of neutrality over all these years? Well, I think that um, that is a very, very difficult question to, to answer. I think because we have been extremely fortunate to keep out of war, we have not had any, uh, anything damaged, destroyed. Our production uh, apparatus is still in, has been intact all the time. We have, of course, been um, fortunate in terms of trade. We've been, I mean, after 1945, most countries in Europe were starving. And, uh, Sweden was in a very good uh, position. We did what we could to help, but of course we also had a very advantageous situation from uh, an economic point of view. Um, I, I'm not quite sure I, I understood your question. Do you think, do you mean that Sweden would have been worse off if we had uh, been involved in I think it's an arguable question, because failure to get involved in things like NATO and other kinds of international agreements I think have have uh, probably cost Sweden something in terms of trading possibilities. Now that's possible, and of course we there is nothing to be gained economically. I mean, the Swedish uh, defense costs have been very very considerable co compared to, even compared to members of NATO. So it's not for economic reasons that we stay out of, of NATO. Certainly not to make a profit in the economic area. I was curious when you mentioned Sweden's role as kind of like an arbitrator, not like Switzerland that doesn't get involved. It's not Sweden is not becoming lost from the European mainstream, things like that. Is a country then like Switzerland that is neutral, are they in any worse of a position because they haven't become involved diplomatically, haven't become, I guess maybe as you were pointing out, like Sweden and Austria were actively trying to solve things? Is that bad? or at least not as good as they could be doing, in your opinion? Well, I think that uh, there's a different dif uh, there is a basic difference in attitude between Switzerland and uh, Sweden. So, uh, Sweden is not a neutral country in the same sense as Switzerland. Our neutrality is not guaranteed by any kind of treaties. It's not recognized in any legal uh, meaning. Uh, and that means that we, we want it that way. Sweden has never claimed to be neutral in peacetime. That means we are free to take a stand in a way that the Swiss, Swiss don't regard themselves to be free. So when, for example, the Swiss government has criticized American involvement in Nicaragua or the Vietnam War or other things, they, that is entirely in, in uh, accordance of our interpretation of neutrality and in interpretation of the, non, the policy of non-alignment. And that is a very important point. The Swiss pre, uh, protect their right for themselves to interpret neutrality. It's, they don't expect others to, to, 
make the interpretation and force an interpretation on them. <coughs> but this is a very controversial issue, of course. Not too long ago, I read one authority who stated that were Finland to be invaded by the Russians, Sweden would immediately join NATO. I wonder, what, what is your opinion on that? What if the balance were to change in Scandinavia? How would Sweden react? Well, that is a hypothetical question, of course. I think that uh, in Sweden, that is a very common argument, that Sweden can never join NATO, because if we did, that would mean a, a total dependence of Finland on the Soviet Union. That would mean that the Soviet Union would uh, put its border in the Baltic, I mean, to, that the, the position of Poland over Finland would be equal as the satellites in Eastern Europe. But as long as Sweden remains outside NATO and, and conducts a policy of strict non-alignment, that makes it possible for Finland to pursue a policy of a sort of neutrality. As a matter of fact, it, that is one of the most surprising thing of, of um, uh, the post-war development in all of Europe. The, the uh, success of Finland to remain uh, to, to retain a large measure of independence. They, can, they, they cannot join the European community, they can of course not join NATO, but they are not uh, bound to the Soviet Union in a way that it might have been if the dividing line between East and West had gone in the Baltic with Sweden joining NATO. I think that is what the Nordic balance means. And I think most people in Sweden agree that that should never change, if possible. This will have to be the last question. Okay, I was just wondering, a few years ago, so, um, the Swedes seemed to be, like, we read in the papers that they were kind of, like, anti-Soviet Union when the things happened, like the whiskey on the rocks and in Karlskrona area, that with the Swedish Navy being kind of upset at the Soviet Union, because, you know, supposed to be very secretive and stuff. But then um, I've talked to many Swedes and they all seem to be so pro-Soviet Union over America because they don't like Reagan and stuff. So I'm just wondering, what is their actual thought about the Soviet Union? Because I really don't know. Well, um, I would say that um, of course that's been, uh, been a critical uh, opinion about the United States in Sweden, but not nothing like uh, in the late 60s or early 70s. As a matter of fact, Sweden in some ways are, cons uh, are considered to be the most uh, Americanized country in Europe. Uh, I think that's true in some areas. And uh, even those people who criticize American foreign policy in some areas and, and some try, try to excuse uh, the Soviet foreign policy, if they had a choice, I have no doubt that they would end up on the American side. Uh, that, Sure, I have no problem. And, and uh, there is no pro-Soviet pro uh, opinion in Sweden. Only, only a very, very small one, very narrow groups. Thank you very much. Thank you.